the interaction between ayurveda and biology it started long ago initially it started with the european penetration into india modern science which we uh, some people dated from the royal society but essentially it started with the renaissance as many of us know and in, in the area of medicine the most important thing which happened during renaissance according to me two things happened we had medicine earlier galen's medicine hippocrates aristotle all these people had written about medicine medicine had been practiced in europe there was medical science but that science was different from what happened after renaissance and the two things which changed according to me one was accurate observation like vesalius the great classic the fabric of the human body most painstaking dissection many many years uh, even the smallest lumbrical muscles the carpal bones tarsal bones smallest things everything had been seen and recorded which did not happen earlier like aristotle says women have less number of teeth than men he would have easily counted the teeth of mrs aristotle and found it was incorrect but that did not happen it was not considered very important including our ayurveda accurate description observation that is very much after renaissance second is experiment if you have an idea if you have a hypothesis it is not in a debate you score over somebody else and establish your view it is by doing experiment that came in the most outstanding example was william harvey <coughs> circulation of blood had been discussed in so many uh, texts by so many people but there were many many unanswered questions about circulation how does the blood go round and round everybody knew the heart was pumping including our charaka blood was coming out of the heart to different parts of the body that was obvious but then heart doesn't manufacture blood how does it come back venous return that was a big puzzle all sorts of ideas but it was experiment William Harvey Now these two things changed science If you don't have these two even today you will have no science So modern science accurate observation and experiment So that European science when it started coming you must remember this renaissance was also in the early stages European science was not all that developed because 16th century when the portuguese first came to india that's where all this began as far as india is concerned portuguese first came vasco de gama to our calicut and the place was rather inhospitable for him and they shifted to goa and goa was an overseas portuguese portuguese province as they called it that's where all this began the first contact of european medicine those is medicine was part of biology or biology was part of medicine because plant science was taught in medical schools in those days so that was the first contact so i want to give initially a picture of what the practice of medicine was in the portuguese province of goa the context in the 16th 17th centuries that is where this began and subsequently it has gone through a series of stages i'll try to trace it and also tell you what is happening today i will not be getting into the practice of medicine it is essentially the contact of uh, modern science through biology interacting with ayurveda now the 16th century when uh, the portuguese came to goa the health conditions were extremely bad and as you see here epidemics were very common tropical diseases raged and they were completely unprepared to meet with this kind of a disastrous environment and according to professor op jaggi who had done extensive research on this the population of goa as you see reduction from 400000 to 40000 in a matter of 10 years 10 viceroys wise, wise and governors perished during this time because of uh, falling victims to these diseases and the problem for the portuguese physicians there were never e- enough of them and when they ran out of medications which were coming from europe they were forced to depend 
on Ayurvedic medications, what was locally available. And for fevers which killed a large number of people, they found sandalwood was being used extensively. That was their first introduction to Ayurvedic medications. So you see records of, uh, there is a, an American scientist or a social scientist uh, uh, who has done extensive work on this. I'll be taking much of this material from his uh, published uh, work. And the, on the official side, the European Portuguese administration, they had all sorts of rules that the Indian physicians uh, cannot treat unless they have Portuguese qualifications, etc., etc. But rules were on the one side, but in actual practice, they had to depend on Ayurvedic physicians, local people, because nobody else was available. That was the situation. Now here, this is uh, Dr. Walker from the United States who had done uh, several years of study. And fortunately in Goa, their, their archives are intact, well preserved, so he had access to them. And 1782, there were no European physicians available because Portuguese interest had shifted to Brazil. Very few were willing to come. And a traditional physician, he was appointed by Governor Cotino, who was extremely fond of him. He had no formal medical education, but he was put as the chief physician. And look at the responsibilities. There's a large military hospital treating over 3,000 patients a year. And this hospital had been favorably commented upon by Jesuit visitors. They said there are very few hospitals like this in Europe in the 18th century. Uh, he had to run the pharmacy and also a herbal garden. All this was put in charge of this man. And his name was Peo and also called Alfonso. That was, he was actually a Brahmin. In the government, the uh, Cotino's uh, letters, he always writes a Brahmin. But his name had been changed to Peo or Alfonso. Now he produced a book descriptions and virtues of medicinal roots. Now this became a standard publication for use not only in Goa, but also the Portuguese provinces in the whole of Asia, like Macau and many others, so long. So it was used in many of these, it became a, a standard uh, publication. Now one of the plants mentioned in that extensively is cobra wood. There is a lot of controversy about what this cobra wood is. I find the Ayurvedic physicians I consulted, Professor Ramankuti in Kotakal, he says there is no such medication in Ayurveda. Ayurvedic texts do not mention. The identity of it is still uncertain, but it is believed that it is, represents five different types of roots which were extensively used. And it grows in Sri Lanka and South India and is referred to in many, many Indo Portuguese texts published in those uh, centuries. Now, it, in the uh, what is reported in this literature, not in our Ayurvedic texts, it was used in treating rheumatism, smallpox, measles, cholera. All these, this had been used extensively. Identity is still uncertain. Now the Vaidyas in Goa, hospital facilities were largely limited to the use of Portuguese army personnel and their families. The <coughs> demand greatly exceeded the supply. Large number of patients, not enough Portuguese doctors. So therefore, Vaidyas were conscripted more or less uh, to take care of these especially tropical diseases, fevers for which they had no cure. And they held a number of important posts in the 16th and 17th centuries. And there is evidence in uh, Walker's uh, research is found. They had even treated members of the aristocracy, Portuguese, the governor and uh, so on. But on the legal side, they faced a number of restrictions, number of natives who could practice medicine, number of those who could be registered, the procedure for registration. So all kinds of administrative hurdles faced them. But on the practical side, the access to this was free. Ayurvedic medications especially were freely used. Now this is what I mentioned, the number of European physicians willing to come to India was very low and Portuguese interest had shifted to Brazil. And more and more Indian physicians were uh, taken into service. Goa, Daman, Dew, all the Portuguese colonies. So therefore, during this period, there was a, a hybrid medicine in practice. A dualistic type of approach, Vaidyas of Indian origin in Goa, 
their medicine they had learned from the local konkani physicians and also the ayurvedic physicians ayurveda practiced in in kerala because ayurveda there is a regional flavor ayurveda practiced in even today in uh, say gujarat rajasthan or kerala you will find regional differences so in uh, goa primarily they were influenced by the konkani physicians of goa konkan region and also the kerala type of ayurveda these were the two which were popular in terms of the medications and procedures but in british india british at that time were also colonizing india there was a sharp prejudice against ayurveda in contrast to that in goa there was a much greater degree of acceptance of ayurvedic medicine in fact by the mid 17th century the indian healing techniques the colonial medicine of portugal this had become a standard part of that now these are some a list of uh, the commonly used which they took this is a very long list i have just listed a few of these uh, medicinal plants used in ayurveda uh, which were adopted into the practice of medicine in portugal for various uh, indications incidentally the common even today 80% of uh, uh, the reasons why pa patients go to hospital these are all for general illnesses they don't require special care so most of these are meant for the treatment of general illnesses gastro gastrointestinal fever infections and so on now this again the list opium which was not in our uh, traditional medicine but all the many others you will find tamarind they were all used extensively in the part, practice of medicine now this was the context in goa when a most remarkable man appeared in goa garcia d'orta i want to say something about him he was a very interesting person he was a spanish jew who got his education in portugal as a physician and uh, he came to india in the fleet of alfonso de sousa who was a personal friend of his in 1534 and he practiced medicine in goa for 36 years he was a most remarkable man as long as he was living in goa he was considered to be a catholic believed to be a catholic but after his death it was discovered he was a catholic he was a, a jew not a catholic and they dug up and burnt the body because inquisition had come to goa that's a bit of historical interest now he published in 1563 a most remarkable book colloquies on the simples and drugs of india and now this is most remarkable the first one uh, printed publication on indian medicinal plants and indian medicine for the western reader it is in the form of a dialogue at that time in europe it was very uh, popular to write books in the form of a dialogue a discussion between two people now here there is a, a ruano who is asking he is like a stooge of the of diotra who asks a question sometimes foolish questions and diotra would be reply so that is how the book written there are 57 colloquies each one about a medicinal plant some of them are non medicinal also there are a few on a diamond ivory etc which were used it dealt primarily with uh, with with botany tropical medicine a lot of it and historical and geographic and kindred subjects because he was a very keen observer of the surroundings now this was written in portuguese originally it was translated into latin and within a year it went through five editions it became a, a kind of a best seller in europe soon it was translated into all the european languages so his historical uh, document and apart from the new information coming from uh, asia about a new type of medicine new ways of treatment diorta when he was writing in goa often he criticized uh, galen which was unthinkable in one of the letters he writes i couldn't have could not have written this if i was living in spain because it was impossible they are unthinkable to criticize galen questioning the authority but since he was far away in goa he writes he could criticize so this critical remarks written by a portuguese about galen that also kind of electrified the whole intellectual europe that there is somebody here questioning galen and also in the indian uh, literature our diseases like cholera or smallpox 
these are uh, extraordinarily uh, vivid uh, pictures of diseases. It's a kind of a morbid art. But in our text, there are hardly any vivid descriptions of diseases. If you look at the whole of Charaka Samhita, for example, there are only two references to Masurika, which is very strange. There are 400 plus on fevers, but on smallpox, such a dramatic disease, you simply, once you see it, many, I don't think anybody here would have seen smallpox sitting in this audience. I have seen smallpox. Once you see a smallpox, you can never forget it. Such a dramatic, terrifying disease. And yet, there are no descriptions on that, or cholera. These descriptions of diseases, accurate observation, that is lacking. Now you will find in Diorta accurate descriptions of diseases, like especially I mentioned cholera of dysentery. And this is not only here, you, British visitors, they also excelled in this. In fact, I think, because I am more familiar with British literature, they were masters in this. Just a slight digression. For example, we talk about angina pectoris today. Everybody knows angina. But the first time, the angina, the cry of the heart muscle for food, that description of Heberden in the 18th century, it's a most poetic, beautiful description, angina, of Parkinson's description of uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, they were actually great writers who became physicians. That's the impression you get when you read. And here, Diotta also has that gift of writing about diseases in a dramatic, vivid manner. So the Sarpagandha, which many of you would have heard, Ravolfia Serpentina, that is not mentioned in the Ayurvedic Charaka Sushrata Vagpata. That is one of the very important drugs mentioned by Diotta. And that of course, in 1950s, after Dr. Vakil's use for treating hypertension in Bombay, it gave rise to reserpine, which is no longer used for treating hypertension. But at that time, when the drugs were very few, it did make a great difference in 1950s. And then came the uh, not only the 1950s work on hypertension, the, the Sarpagandha in uh, North India is called Pagal Kijadi. That is how it is called. The common language for it is the root which is used. Now that, incidentally, it was also used in treating insomnia and so on. But this was picked up in Europe. I happened to read a long article in Current Science not long ago. It was that work on the effect of serpentina on brain chemistry. It led to a whole lot of work on neurotransmitters. Apparently two Nobel Prizes were given, not on Sarpagandha. But on the work on neurotransmitters originated, deriving inspiration from the work which started on Sarpagandha. That's a bit of history. Now the root of China, Smilax China is also mentioned by Diotta, which was used in the, it originally came from China. Incidentally, Portuguese colonies in China and Goa, there was a great deal of exchange. Diotta's book was ext extremely well used in uh, Portuguese China. So this drug came from China. And it is not mentioned in the Ayurvedic text, but you will find Bhava Mishras, which was published in the 15th century, Bhava Prakashan, that is an Ayurvedic text. There you find a mention of this in treating syphilis, which was called Firangi Roga in India, which was not there in the Brahatray. Now the window which was opened by Diorta was thrown wide open by another remarkable man called Van Reed. Van Reed was a, a Dutch governor of uh, Kochi. He was not a medical person. He had no higher education. He was a brilliant general. He joined the Dutch Navy and he came to set up his headquarters in Kochi. And there, one of the things he ob observed in his uh, introduction, he writes that he found the people in Kerala, he thought they were very healthy. His description, I come from Kerala, but I think they must, our people in those days must have been much healthier than we are today. But he started wondering, how is it that these people are very healthy? They work very hard. And he attributed this to their extensive use of spices. Uh, spices and uh, 
all these ayurvedic medications even in our boiled water all sorts of spices are put there pepper is put there jeera is put there so everywhere this van reer observed in their daily cooking turmeric is used not large quantities but small quantities every day all through the life so van reer attributed the good health to the extensive use of this and immediately as a great organizer he set up a team of almost 100 people including herbalists ayurvedic physicians professors of botany linguistic scholars military men and he commanded a, a group of almost 100 people to collect these plants from all the way from kanyakumari to goa and the most authentic description of these plants and that work was a classic work of uh, uh, van reed now this uh, it, the work went on for 30 years it is published in 12 volumes in latin from amsterdam that is hortus malabaricus the garden of malabar it's a great classic and this 740 plants compared to 57 of dorta and the names are given in malayalam which is our language sanskrit latin and arabic each plant name is given ethnobotanical information is given and exquisite drawings in fact van reed found two of his soldiers they were very skilled artists so he pulled them out of the dutch army and asked them to illustrate even today they are extraordinarily fine drawings you simply cannot excel them and the dutch east india company financed all this because whenever the europeans did something there was always a commercial angle they were very coming to east It was not for spiritual enlightenment they were coming for commerce to make profit so here they found these medicinal plants which is being discovered in india they could have a big market in the world in fact when they signed agreement with the, the king of travancore one of the special articles is the spices which they were buying from the king of travancore travancore shall not export it without their permission so this is one of the very important objectives of their coming to india so here dutch east india company financed it and one of their hopes was this could be, become a best seller these medications of from india and linnaeus made use of this he acknowledges his debt to van reed and it was only much later by professor manilal of calicut who translated this into malayalam and english in 2003 and 2008 another 30 year effort to do this now indian medicinal plants this was picked up by many others it became the bandwagon those days ainsley and many other british uh, uh, botanists started working on these published several volumes there was an indian moyuddin sharif in chennai who published an extensive publication in 1869 and scientific and popular interest in india's medicinal plants it reached uh, the height in those days the high water mark as they say and in the 19th century 75% of the drugs of vegetable origin in british pharmacopoeia they were of indian origin but interestingly in the 19th century and early 20th century the british set up a series of research institutions in india this is important because often people think the british imposed western medicine on india which is not true they set up hospitals in calcutta initially and many other places essentially for their soldiers and their families they did not want the natives to access the their hospitals they had simply no space no staff they did not encourage it in fact they thought there might be serious objection to western medicine but the fact of the matter is the natives took interest in it often in calcutta you will find in madras they raised a subscription of 30000 rupees for the british to establish a hospital so it was extremely popular the british soldiers were feared administrators were hated but the british physicians and nurses they were welcomed they set up along with this extensive uh, spread of uh, hospitals services all over india what is not remembered they also set up a series of research institutes in medicine for example the indian research fund association which they set up the forerunner of icmr it preceded medical research council of britain it was set up before that in india half kinetic shoot mumbai 
ന്യൂട്രീഷൻ റിസർച്ച് ലബോറട്ടറി ഇന്ന് കൂണൂർ കിങ് ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് ഗിണ്ടി സെൻട്രൽ റിസർച്ച് ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് കസാവളി ആൻഡ് സ്കൂൾ ഓഫ് ട്രോപ്പിക്കൽ മെഡിസിൻ കൽക്കട്ട ബട്ട് ദർ വാസ് നോട്ട് വൺ ഫോർ ആയുർവേദിക് മെഡിസിൻ ഇവൻ ഡോ ദി ന്യൂ ഇറ്റ് വാസ് എക്സിസ്റ്റിംഗ് ഇറ്റ് വാസ് ബീങ് പ്രാക്ടീസ്ഡ് എക്സ്റ്റൻസീവ്ലി ബട്ട് ദർ വാസ് നോ ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് ടു ഇൻവെസ്റ്റിഗേറ്റ് ആയുർവേദ but interestingly in the school of tropical medicine which they established there was a remarkable scientist ramnath chopra who later on became president of our indian national science academy he was the father of indian pharmacology now when he joined the school of tropical medicine calcutta he established a department of pharmacology and look at the objectives he had his aim was to make indian pharmacology self supporting by enabling her to utilize locally produced drugs economically notice the word her he calls uh, indian pharmacology in female that's a very far sighted today of course uh, it would be welcomed it would be considered ordinary but in those days he calls indian pharmacology a female gender so that shows his respect and to to utilize locally produced drugs economically understand understand the laboratory conditions that was one because there was no standardization whatsoever in those days and secondly to discover remedies from the claims of ayurveda tb etc indigenous systems suitable to be employed in the practice of modern medicine these were the two objectives of ramnath chopra and his work involved botanical identification chemical analysis pharmacological and clinical trials of a large number of drugs and his studies included physiologic action of active components often setting up uh, nerve muscle preparations and see how the drugs act on them in vivo in animals all these studies were done biophysical and biochemical and rolfia serpentina he did extensive work in 1933 which was picked up by you will see later on asima chatterjee and his book these two books especially these two volumes medicinal and poisonous plants of india they became standard reference for more than 50 years mm-hmm. that was initially we found the window was plant sciences but now the window is pharmacology for the first time another window on ayurveda of science mm-hmm. now 20th century came and that was it was a natural growth from pharmacology to organic chemistry because like the especially like ashima chatterjee and govinda acharya i have just given two names there were a large number of organic chemists who did outstanding work and uh, working on old plants rawolfia vinca rosea etc and govinda acharya worked extensively on all these alkaloids terpenoids characterization of plants looking for activity he did extensive work on neem he even developed a bio pesticide based on that so in the 20th century a large number of publications and india became a leader in natural products chemistry if you look at it today ayurvedic research that is of greater interest there are three types of research in ayurveda one is on medicinal plants the other is clinical studies and the third is basic science but the importance attached to this is in the decreasing order If you look at the medicinal plants as you know it is an old story going on for hundreds of years identification characterization isolation test for activity it has been going on seriously for 70 years from ratna chopra's time and there are papers published by the thousands it's a huge database and the only significant outcome out of these rawolfia and uh, gugulu these are the only two drugs which came to the market and neither of which can claim a great success either in science or in economics in fact professor uh, sukhadev who did all the organic chemis- chemistry work on gugulu uh, he has uh, lamented uh, how these have not done well he is so disappointed it did not do so well they have been superseded by many other drugs we don't have anything comparable to the chinese artemisinin Uh, from a chinese medicinal plant so when you look at this 70 years or 100 years of our effort in looking for a molecular drug from plants uh, it's a one of disappointment that we haven't got anything to show for this and often it seems to me that our approach 
com- in contrast to what the Chinese did during the Vietnam War, a large number of Chinese soldiers dying of malaria. And they decided that we are going to, like Indian Ayurvedic medicinal plants also, a large number of them are treat- treatment of fever. In fact, in the search that I did, archaeoepidemiology, there are 430 references to fevers uh, compared to 50 for diabetes. So fevers killed a large number of people in Chinese medicine also. So a large number of medicinal plants were used for treating fevers. Now some 2,000 of them, herbal preparations. And they took it up as a challenge. They reduced it by textual studies to 200. They made a short list. And they started testing in, uh, in uh, a mouse model. And they found most of them were not effective. So it was a great disappointment. So I think 15 years, I think, or 10 years. And they found this artemisinin, that particular uh, extract, herbal extract which they were giving, was weakly effective. Now that lady, I forget her name, uh, who was the manager of this whole program, who received the Lasker Prize in the, in the United States for this great work. I only have read the speech, I have not read the original papers. There she says, when they found this weak activity, they were about to give, it, give that up. But she said, let us take a look at this. After all this search, we have come to nothing. And they found they were using, like our kashayams, these plants would be boiled. That is how they make an extract. That was the standard method that they followed. But when they looked at the original Chinese text, it was not, it is an a, a, extract at room temperature. They never boiled it. So she said, why not we try this? So they simply soaked it at room temperature and that showed very much greater activity. That's what gave them the cue. And they isolated the compound. When they crystallized it, the West took immediate notice of it. It became a drug. So today that is the only drug for falciparum malaria. We haven't got anything like that. And to some extent, the reason, according to me, as a non-expert in this area, if you want, if you are looking for a particular candidate drug in an, an ancient preparation, you are essentially looking like a Jim Corbett looking for a man-eater. He knows the man-eater is there in that particular area, so many square miles. He knows it is there because all the deaths have been in that area. And he goes after it. And finally, he writes so vividly at, after an extensive search, danger lurking everywhere. Suddenly you begin to feel that man eater's eyes are on me because you are close to him. You almost develop a sixth sense. Now, if you are aware that in 20, suppose you say take a particular fever and there are 20 or 30 Indian plants. Remember the Chinese, they had 2,000 herbal extracts. They reduced to 200. So if we do a shortlisting in our own way and then we start looking for the compounds in that, with that only, nothing else, that, as you know, an Indian medicinal plant has many, many actions. It is not only just reducing high blood pressure. It may do many other things. But don't be distracted by all those. We are only looking at this and nothing else. If that kind of a highly focused individual effort, you are more likely to find. Uh, which, whereas what we tend to do, you take 100 plants, each plant may have 1,000 compounds, so you have a huge number of compounds, uh, you do characterization, and then you look for activity in various types of uh, cell cultures, various types of targets, 50 or 100, so have enormous data, rapid throughput screening, then it goes to a committee, uh, this is all anonymized, and finally the committee looks at all the data and comes to some conclusion you will never find a drug like this. You will never catch a man-eater through a committee. You need this individual sharply focused approach, partly based on intuition. Uh, this is what happened in uh, Artemisin and, and we need to change our, our approach. Now, if you look at the clinical studies, I was talking to some friends yesterday, the WHO in 2000, they held a big conference in Hong Kong. India was also a participant about the trial for uh, traditional drugs. As you know, modern uh, drugs, if you want to include it in the Indian pharmacopoeia, it has to go through a very rigid phase one, phase two, phase three, etc. It has to go through a double-blind, randomized controlled trial. 
There is no substitute. You have to do that. But there are various problems, conceptual, procedural, in adopting this in traditional medicine, whether it is Chinese or Indian. So this WHO conference was on this issue, and they agreed that this double-blind randomized controlled trial would no longer be insisted for traditional drugs. Of course, that is the gold standard that with the highest evidentiary value. Other methods which are acceptable will not have the same degree of evidentiary value, but it, it is considered as evidence. That is a step forward. And secondly, in modern medicine, if you are trying a particular drug, you cannot be giving any other drugs at the same time. That would vitiate the whole trial, invalidate the trial. So here in Ayurveda, it is always two or three things are combined. There may be an external application, maybe some drug you are taking in the morning, another drug in the evening. So number of things are combined. Now this is not accepted in a controlled trial. But here they accepted a black box approach. That means for treating this disease, A, B, C, D are combined. That is accepted as a black box. You cannot add an E to that. So A, B, C, D is a black box. No questions are asked. That is accepted. Then the patient serves as his own control. Not 100 control, 100 study subjects. That is not there. So in so many ways, these standards were liberalized in that meeting. It may have been further liberalized. I have not kept up with that literature. But the extraordinary thing is, painful thing, we don't have any papers based on these liberalized guidelines. In spite of having large number of Ayurvedic colleges, large number of hospitals, I believe we are producing 25,000 Ayurvedic doctors every year. It's a huge activity, but we have no papers, even based on these liberalized guidelines. And lastly, we come to basic science applied. That is another story. P.C. Ray, many of you may know, wrote the famous History of Indian Chemistry, published more than a hundred years ago in two volumes, extraordinarily fine uh, book. And there he calls 800 B.C. to 600 A.D. the Ayurvedic period in India's history of science. And the reason he said that, because Ayurveda is not only the mother of medicine, it is also the mother of Rasa Shastra, Mercury, chemistry, in which he was interested. He was one of the great chemists of India. It is also the mother of plant science in India, and to some extent, even veterinary science. So I would say it is the mother of life sciences. In spite of that, there is hardly any contact between scientists and Ayurveda. It is almost like they don't talk to each other at all. There is no forum where they interact in India, scientists and Ayurvedic physicians. They have been completely apart. Now, this was the background against which in 2007, I found it very difficult that departments, we have Department of Science and Technology, we have Department of Biotechnology, BRNS, we have a number of agencies dealing with science, very strong departments, well-funded departments, but they have no interaction with Ayurveda. We have an Irish department, they don't interact. So this was a context which is self-defeating, impoverishing both the disciplines. So therefore, in 2007, I found some support from uh, Dr. Chidambaram, the principal scientific advisor. He said, for the initial, for starting something like this in a novel area, it's an orphan area, nobody wants it, we can give some support. Uh, but if the initial work is successful, shows promise, then somebody will take it up. That was how we started this whole it was called a science initiative in Ayurveda at that time, in 2007. Now, this has many problems for the investigator. It's not easy to do this. And the first problem is identifying concepts, procedures, or products which would lend themselves to this kind of research. For example, there are a number of concepts in Ayurveda. Take, for example, Ritucharya. I'm just giving an example. Ayurveda believes the, co the code of conduct, daily life, there is a code, how to spend a day. But the Indian summer, Indian winter, these are all written in North India, where they were very severe. So they, there are six seasons in the Indian uh, tradition, but Ayurveda recognized two, they divided into two halves. One is the hot, dry half, and the other is the wet, 
cold half now during the dry half adana all the water everything is drawn away from earth by the hot sun now all this is returned during the other half this is the an over simplification but during these two halves your body is drying up it is being uh, the moisture is being regained in the other half your code of conduct your food your clothing everything must adapt to this that is ritucharya body itself does it for example in the hot weather we sweat adaptation in the cold weather we will shiver to raise the temperature so body also is doing naturally but the human effort supplements that now this is an old concept now can that concept be studied using science is there any evidence for this when they say body becomes dry various states or chemistry changes is there any any way you can test it now that is the problem here is a, an old concept is it testable you don't have to accept it that's the first part the second thing is if you have an idea you feel can be done then converting it into a protocol how exactly how do you select the subjects what is the test that you are going to if you take for example the ayurveda if you read the the tastes which change the, these two halves taste in ayurveda rasa means chemistry it is a short form for chemistry in those days so if chemistry is changing if you can you take blood samples and check is most unlikely you will find any change or take urine and test it that is not a good protocol but today if you look at it suppose you look at the microbiome microbiome is the millions of trillions of organisms in our body wherever body is in contact with the environment this microbiome that is the hottest subject in biology today literally dozens of papers coming every day now this microbiome they do a number of functions in the body metabolic immunologic etc now that could be different in different seasons that is well known now is there a, so therefore if you want to make a protocol to test this concept you need to have and that is very advanced science if you have a trillion organisms you are going to do dna sequencing on this trillion you can imagine the massive data that you have uh, you need uh, first rate uh, bioinformatics people a great deal of money to do this kind of analysis and see if there is a change in these two halves in the microbiome composition profile now that is a protocol so therefore to have a concept develop that concept and then develop a protocol which anybody can do and then having done that you have to find the partners a very good biologist who do this study and an ayurvedic person who will be willing to collaborate you have to find partners who will work together and most difficult of all is to overcome the skepticism the moment you say adana oh no there is that's all nonsense this attitude and ayurvedic physicians on the other hand we have done it for 4000 years we don't need all this validation forget it if you take that view which we have done so many years we will get nowhere we will be exactly where we are but if you wish to move forward because often great advances come from interdisciplinary work because we should not build a compartment which is necessary but then imprison ourselves in that compartment we cannot get out that has to change now to take it specific example rasayana is a very important branch of ayurveda there are eight branches of ayurveda rasayana is one of them that is you may put it in any way to strengthening the body aging without tears you can put it in any way essentially it is a positive step to strengthen the body to rejuvenation now ayurveda the definition vatpada's famous definition rasayana he says this particular it's a very vatpada is a great poet he says satyavadinam akrotham athyatma athyatma pravanendriyam shantam sat vritti niratam vidya nitya rasayana and that is what i have translated here truthfulness freedom from anger spiritual contemplation tranquility and performance of good deeds this is the real rasayana now can you really do any experimental work on this so we have to first of all accept 
Many of these Ayurvedic concepts, they are not analyzable at all. They are not testable by modern science. We should accept it, that humility we should have. Before we dismiss things, make uh, judgmental statements, we should accept this. So all that we can do, Rasayana in addition to all this, we also give some formulations. That is testable. Knowing very well, it is a reductionist approach. It has its limitations, but that is what we can do. So we identified in the first round five projects. I won't go into all that. I just want to give one example. I'm very glad Professor Subra, who is here uh, in this Amalaki Rasayana testing, uh, we decided to do two or three models. One was the RAT model. He's an internationally known authority on DNA chain breaks, single and double strand breaks, and the repair as an index of genomic stability, especially with aging. I knew his expertise in this area, so I requested him rats fed with Rasayana, Amalaki Rasayana, which was chosen. Will you be able to do this test? He readily agreed. I will be making a reference to that. I am so glad he is here with us today. It was also tested in Drosophila model in Banaras, the same Rasayana. Just look at the findings. These are Dr. Subarao's work. I have quoted here. They have published this, which is, you see here. It is a Mechanism of Aging and Development, a high-impact journal. Now, these are adult Vistar rats, six months. They are fed this Amalaki Rasayana five days a week. This was prepared specially for this study by Ayurveda Shala. They are not commercial samples. And three, nine, and 15 months, the rats are killed. Uh, the brain, the neurons, and astrocytes are separated. And the DNA damage as an index of genomic stability. These are measured through comet assay and also biochemical methods. Now, the summary of results in neurons and astrocytes, genomic stability is measured by comet assay as well as the tail moment, which I don't understand very much. But what I understand is the DNA, the DNA chain breaks and the length of the tail, the product of that, express as uh, software units. That is a, gives a number. Otherwise, it is only an appearance. So in both these, there is no question that the rats fed with Amalaki Rasayana, they do much better, their genomic stability is much better, DNA chain breaks are much less. And actually by 15 months, this difference becomes very large indeed. So therefore, in the, the six months old rats, there is no question that this Rasayana uh, gives protection. Now if you look at the, the same Rasayana given to Drosophila in Banaras, it took a long time, almost uh, nine months, to determine the dosage for Drosophila. Nobody knew how to. In fact, uh, Dr. Lakotia was initially skeptical because Amalaki Rasayana, they also use uh, honey and uh, ghee in the preparation. So he told me that maybe the honey and ghee is doing this. Amalaki may have nothing to do with it. So he did an experiment initially. The first year almost, he, he kept on doing things like this. When he gave the Amalaki Rasayana, before doing that, he gave this honey and ghee. Most of the flies died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he quickly changed. Then the dosage, what concentration to give. It's quite difficult. <coughs> Finally, he found that it was 0.5% supplementation is the right dosage. I'm just telling you the experimental problems which uh, they face in doing this kind of work. And there was no attempt to isolate the compound. That is another, so 20 years ago, Lakotia's paper would not have been accepted by PLOS. It's also published. Because they would insist you have to have the compound. You cannot have an extract containing so many things. But here, time is changing. That paper is accepted. Now here, this we never made any attempt to isolate an active compound. Because in 100 years, we haven't isolated any, any drug. So we didn't want to get into that. So the entire extract was given. And uh, the same Amalaki Rasayana, which was used by Professor Subarao, which we got from cortical. Now here, if you look at that, the, the larvae, earlier pupation, which are fed on this, and they showed significant increase in the salivary gland size. The DNA content per nucleus is increased. And the females fed with this diet, there is the fecundity is much greater, the number of eggs. These are all, I'm quoting from that paper. Now here is the salivary gland size, this is the control. Now, this is the Amalaki Rasayana. You can see a very much greater increase. 
But one of the curious findings, this is Rasa Sindur, because we had another project going on, Rasa Sindur, which is derived from mercury. And there is a project we were interested because mercury is highly toxic. We would never consider using mercury-derived drugs. But here, in Ayurveda, and to a greater extent, the Siddha system, they use it extensively. And they do not find the kind of effects, toxic effects that we see. So there was a project in uh, IIT Kharagpur on the microstructural characterization of Rasa Sindur. We had been doing that project, supporting the project there. Professor Roy was doing that. Because chemistry, you will always find mercury there. Maybe, therefore, this non-toxicity, which is claimed by Ayurvedic physicians, that may be because of the physical structure, which could influence the behavior. That work was going on, which Lakotia knew. So he borrowed some Rasa Sindur from out of his sheer interest. He gave it and he found, actually, he's doing a new project on this, incidentally, because of this finding. There, that also does increase in the salivary gland size. And when you look at this increase in the medium lifespan in days, and days are long time in a, the life of a fruit fly, increase in the thermal stress tolerance, increase in starvation tolerance. There is no question that it has uh, all the life parameters which he has reported, they are all improved in, my, in the Drosophila. Now we have, I can't go into all these, the ongoing studies now, one is on Panchakarma, which is being done in uh, Bombay by Urmula Tate, which is in the Nair Hospital Medical College and uh, ATRAC. Uh, Dr. Chiplunkar, she's a well-known immunologist. They are looking, looking at the biochemical and immunologic parameters, correlates of Panchakarma. And in this study, what they have essentially done, is a very big work, but just one in the obesity, Basti is one of the very important ways of treatment. And doing that, they have found uh, all the anti-inflammatory cytokine level levels are going up. This is, they are publishing it now. Similarly, the physical chemical characterization, that is also a paper under publication. What seems to happen is during this long process of making this process indoor, there is a nanotransformation taking place. All the particle size is less than 100 angstrom. So that could very well explain the non-toxicity. And lastly, uh, this is the flagship project the genomic variation analysis and gene expression in these th constitutional types. One of the very fundamental uh, concepts in Ayurveda is the constitutional types. That is, all human beings, they have vata, pitta, or kapat, one of these types. It is fixed at the time of conception. You cannot change it all through life. Now, these types are distinguished on the basis of physical, mental, behavioral traits. These are all described. But there has never been adequate biological evidence for it. You simply classify, and that is important in Ayurveda because the onset of a disease, predisposition to diseases, progression of a disease, course of a disease, and the response to treatment, these are all specific to the dosha, constitutional types, dosha prakriti. But is there a biological basis for it? That is the question. This is again a concept we are using most modern biology. Now, in this study, which is an extensive study, it took almost four years, 300 subjects in uh, Udupi, 300 in Bangalore, 300 in Pune, selected by Ayurvedic physicians using traditional means, and blood samples are taken from them, and the three biological parameters we are measuring, we cannot measure all. And one of them is SNP, is being done here in CCMB by Dr. Tangaraj, who is a very well-known scientist. The same sample gene expression is being done by Professor Kondaya in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And the epigenetic change is extremely important. That is being done by Professor Satyamurthy in our Life Sciences Center in Manipal. And the fact is, they are seeing dosha-specific changes. That is also under publication. So this would be, uh, these are all, I can't go into the details, but importantly, these things take time, but this will give rise to Newer and uh, that is my greatest uh, pleasure today because initially when we started 2007, I had to go and uh, request my friends like Professor Subarao, please, will you do this? But today, there is a new trend. People who read Lakotia's paper or Professor Subarao's paper, I am getting letters from young scientists. I would like to do something. Ideas of their own. Now, this is the hope for the future of this Ayurvedic biology. I certainly hope... Uh, 
uh, it will uh, contribute a great deal of new knowledge. I have always asked, uh, somebody asked me, there is a great deal of skepticism which I mentioned earlier. Once in the Indian Institute of Science, a young scientist stood up and said, you are a cardiac surgeon, what do you, why are you doing this, this work? I told him, I am doing it because I enjoy it. Why do I listen to Bhimsen Joshi? I, I, I enjoy that, so I do it. That's the only explanation I can give. I have no other answer. Not that I have a remedy I can give. I can sell it, make a course of rupees. Nothing of the kind. This is very enjoyable work. Something which was described in Buddha's time, 2500 years ago. They were talking about these prakritis. There was no biology or anything in those days. How they got this idea, God alone knows. Now here with the tools, we could not have done this project 30 years ago. Now we can do it. So therefore, when you find a, a kind of validation of something which was conceived 2500 years ago, there is a very special kind of joy. And that is the reward. So those of you who are interested in that kind of reward, there is plenty here to offer. Thank you.